Today you have myself, you have Tomaso Flaherty from ATU Sligo, and you have Aidan Flynn, who is the chairperson from the Freight Transport Association, the chairperson of our consortium group. Uh, we're just going to give you a quick rundown. So Tomas is going to cover from the programme and the student supports. Aidan's going to give you a little bit of an insight into the on-road driver prep for the apprentices. And then I'll just do a little welcome and just a little bit on the social media at the end. And as Aidan said, we are recording this, so we'll circulate this recording and we will also circulate the slides as well. Tomas is going to share them as a PDF at the end. So Tomas, I'll hand it over to you then to take us through. OK, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for tuning in today for, uh, I suppose, a short briefing session. There's a lot of information on this programme, a lot of which maybe you'll have received from Megan already. More that we'll uh, deliver, let's say, on induction day, which is a week from today. Uh, but today we just want to take you through some of the important points uh, in terms of what yourself and maybe your apprentices should be aware of as they embark on the programme and maybe help uh, give you an idea of what the programme is about and trying to achieve from an academic perspective. Um, so just obviously that's our first group of apprentices that we welcomed this time last year to ATU Sligo. Uh, what I'm going to co cover really for uh, today's session, and we go into all of this in much more detail during induction uh, on the 11th of September, but really to give you an idea of what's going to be involved for your apprentices uh, if you're going to be a mentor or you know they're going to be reporting into what they'll be uh, doing during the course of the semesters and also the work that they'll be they'll be looking at during those uh, different modules. So we'll have an, the academic year, just briefly um, an overview of that, then the programme. And then for the mentors that are present, just we're going to touch on the reflective e-portfolio modules where you become really important as mentors. Not that you're not important the whole time, but this is particularly where you're involved and we do uh, a discussion on roles and responsibilities in terms of how we see it and then looking at how we will support the mentors as well and get you up and running when it comes to uh, the delivery of those reflective e-portfolio modules. And then I'll mention some student supports at the end that ATU Sligo uh, provide. You may have some questions on these, but it is something that I would like you to be aware of so that you can also encourage your own apprentices to actually engage with those supports. While we do it ourselves, it's, it's good to have maybe our mentor or someone at work saying, you know, there's this available and maybe you should look into that as well. So that kind of support for them. So if your apprentice is enrolling on the uh, programme, they will be starting lectures tomorrow, two weeks. So on Tuesday, the 19th of September, they will have online lectures. They can sit in the office or at home, wherever you deem appropriate. They'll need a laptop and uh, to log into the lecture and listen live and also then they'll need that laptop or desktop however you want to provide it to log into our virtual learning environment where they can consult the lecture notes and all the assignments and submit and upload but we take them through that on the day and we'll also show uh, the mentors that come along on the day how that works but the key date for us is we have two sept uh, semesters during the academic year September to December with exams in January and then in January, uh, on the 23rd of January, we will be starting um, our lectures again for semester two, which will run to the end of April, beginning of May. And then there's a short exam period in the middle of May uh, if there are exams to be completed. Now, what I have done is put a link here. So when you get the PDF of the notes, you'll be able to click on that and it will actually bring up our academic calendar if you're so inclined to look at it, or at least you know it's there. And we have two. The first one is the main student dates and then we have one with additional dates. But if you were to click on that link, then this would open and you can see we give a general breakdown through the year of the different, uh, I suppose, dates or important dates that students and the mentor should be aware of. And what you can see here is we'll be starting our induction on Monday the 11th. I'm, I'm sure it's difficult to read on a shared screen. And then lectures will start officially in the week commencing Monday the 18th. And for us, in first year, semester one and semester two, lectures are always on a Tuesday. OK, and I'll take you a bit uh, through those later on. OK, and then you can see other dates uh, throughout. It's not that important, uh, but uh, it is something that's there and the, the students can consult that at any time um, across the ATU. What's important to remember is that they will be finished lectures officially in May 2024 after some assessments and assignments and then they'll be free for the summer, except for some of the driving um, lessons and tests, which Aidan will go through uh, with you shortly. 
in terms of it being an academic program, and I suppose that's where uh, my perspective comes from, we have two academic years to get your level six in business. And it consists of September to May, basically, if we look at the, the, the extended period for each academic year, plus the driving element on top of that, which may occur during the summer. Each academic year, as I've said, is divided into two semesters, typically th 13 weeks long. Um, and we have an induction week at the start of the first semester. What our apprentices will experience is one day of online lectures, and I'll show you a typical timetable now where they'll be able to log in from work or from home. And they'll be able to tune into the lectures we'll deliver live, typically for a module is one and a half hours. Um, and they'll listen to that module, they interact with their lecturer, they'll get assignments, they can ask questions during class, they can engage with the lecture. And that's one thing where, you know, colleagues at work and mentors can help our, our students. And this is something especially for first years. They may be a little shy online initially. OK, it's not like being in a room in terms of you, you build a rapport much more quickly. Some people might be shy, might be shy to switch on the camera. But if you can encourage them to ask questions during class, that will add to their experience and hopefully make them feel more uh, involved in the program and involved with their colleagues and involved with the lectures. Now we do uh, bring them to site or to campus uh, a few days uh, every academic year. So the first one will be, as I said, induction day on Monday the 11th of September. That's where everyone's going to meet each other, mentors and students alike, and we'll run through uh, the program in a lot more detail. Solace will come and speak to the apprentices. I will speak to the mentors and hopefully we'll have a session for our apprentices in a computer laboratory if they're registered and then they get a feel for our virtual learning environment, which is very important when we're dealing with, uh, let's say, moving into the online sphere where you, you have to learn how to access where the lectures are and where the, the lecture notes are and how you might do your assessments. But we'll do that in more detail. We also plan to bring our students on campus maybe two or three times a semester. It depends on how the semester uh, falls and how uh, our apprentices are getting on. Uh, we found in the second semester last year with our first year, we brought them on site twice and it does help build rapport. So again, your support with that. Um, it will be a separate day in terms of we try and run it on the Tuesday and they do their lectures here with us rather than taking up another day. OK, now they will have other laboratory days. So in the first year, they will have to go to uh, a HGV uh, garage either in DIT or in TUS, we have to decide that yet, and they will take some of their modules there, but that's more than likely to be a Friday as well as their additional uh, lectures. So that's a module I'll touch on later as well, and I'll highlight why that happens like that. What's important about on-campus days or practical days is that they get to meet you, meet each other and build a rapport. So I would ask you to uh, encourage them to attend um, on campus. Obviously, we do provide the facility to catch up with lectures after, but nothing beats coming to site uh, or campus and meeting their, their class colleagues, which Im improves their learning experience as well. And then, as I mentioned, there'll be first year HGV practical workshops where they will be attending uh, either once or twice uh, in the semester um, to, to actually go through more technical, I suppose, review of HGVs. Uh, and I'll mention the module that's there uh, that they'll be dealing with in terms of that. So. What will be first up is semester one starting on Tuesday, the 19th of September. And as I mentioned, the HGV and CVR testing module, that will be 100% CA means continuous assessment. OK, they do two practicals and they write up about it. There are no exams as such. OK, so they can be writing up about it. If, it, if it's nicely spaced, they can get it done over that period. So that's good. There's no final exam as such. You're writing up some document um, and then you're submitting it in accordance with what's required for that module. We have another module called Personal Effectiveness and ICT. And when the reason we included this module is so that we can help people deliver and develop their ICT skills and also in terms of communicating within the class with the lecturer through reports, through presentations and looking to develop those skills. So that's actually two and a half hours per week, but split in two, a 1.5 hours on personal effectiveness and a one hour on ICT, which will complement the other modules by using the software that you might use in the other modules like Word or PowerPoint to deliver reports or assignments. Then uh, we have the professional driver where uh, Yvonne will take us, uh, take the apprentices through uh, looking all at the different aspects and dimensions of the professional driver. 
And combined with that then is the intro to supply chain, which is delivered by my colleague Chris. Uh, again, that's 1.5 hour lectures, but you'll notice all of those modules in the first semester, there's no real formal exam. There are assessments, of course, and they're called continuous assessments so they can work through and build up their marks there so they don't need to be as daunted uh, by coming back to education and immediately jumping into doing an exam. That won't happen. Now, one of the assessments might be uh, a quiz or might be writing a sort of an assignment or exam in one block, but it's not a formal exam. OK. A typical timetable for our first year students would look like something like this. And please note, I have the link down there. I know it might maybe not as clear on a shared screen, but you can see they'll start at 10 a.m. on uh, Tuesday. They'll have a lecture, then they'll have a short break, then they'll have another lecture, then a short break and another lecture and then finish out the end of the day. So you can see that's a fairly onerous day. If you're sit if you have to sit and listen to someone like me for seven hours, it's going to be a challenge in itself. Um, but they, they are working hard during those uh, courses. And what I would emphasize, and if you are speaking to your apprentices, the key for this, and we say this to every uh, first year student, is try and engage during class because that's where you do your most learning and it'll save time later outside of class trying to catch up and trying to redo stuff that was already covered. Now, the good thing about these online lectures is that they're recorded, OK? So there will be recordings there for any student to go back over them. And then in the virtual learning environment, which we call Moodle, you can post questions in there. And again, we would the lectures will encourage the students to do that because if one student is a query, we can sure another 10 or 20 students have the same query and it's getting them to try and engage in that process that will improve their, their learning experience, I think, or their enjoyment of the program. But you have an idea there from 10 to uh, 4 30, 5 o'clock, maybe some days that they'll be working full time on um, their program. Now, we do want them sitting in those lectures. They need to sit in those lectures every Tuesday and engage with the program. And again, that's where we ask the employers to make sure they encourage that and facilitate that how they can, but also get our students bought into the program early on so that they're asking questions and, you know, challenging in class about topics that they're hearing about and say, well, this is done differently in my company. And, you know, we want to encourage them to express their opinions. But anyway, at the bottom of the link, if you're looking to look at that again, I'll send you this on, but it's not very clear, but you can consult it on the our website. So we get through semester one, we get all our assignments in and our assessments done by the uh, end of December, or beginning of January, and then we're into lectures again. And I said, I think that was about the 24th of January. You'll see that it looks like there's way more modules here, but the first module we see there is the driving test completion and CPC. I won't go into that in detail, so I'll say to refer you to Aidan, who will take us through in detail, but that's a practical element of the course where they're getting their driving license, okay? And then below that, we have the academic modules, let's say. And again, you're saying, well, come on, so you have five there. We still have four left, even if one is driving license. Well, the three middle ones, warehousing and distribution, you can see is a follow on from supply chain in the first semester. We have customer care, which is related to sales and marketing, and then introduction to finance, which again, uh, obviously has a, a place in any uh, business qualification and obviously relevant to the particular sector that we're dealing with. But at the bottom there, you'll see reflective e-portfolio. That's another module, but there are no lecture hours assigned with it. So you see that you don't really have lecture hours assigned to this reflective e-portfolio. And that's where the mentors come in. OK, the mentors are going to help and supervise the apprentices uh, to work on some case studies, which we base around your own company. It's based on what they're doing in the modules and then they're trying to apply it to your company, to your specific company. Um, and really it's just re-emphasizing um, the knowledge that they're learning from the modules and at work while they're working through their apprenticeship. What's important about Reflective ePortfolio is that they're just reflecting on their learning. It's not, I wouldn't say, very academically challenging, but it does take time to work through and think about the case studies that we give you. And we do talk to the mentors about the types of case studies we give. So for example, Introduction to Finance, the, the last year students were asked to look at uh, maybe replacing the fleet of trucks for their company. What would they do? If, what if it was uh, electric vehicles or if there was something like that that uh, they might look into and uh, try and cost that process? So it's trying to build on that work, but the mentors would hopefully be able to meet every week at least uh, with the students to discuss how they're progressing. Now, we only had four to five submissions across the semester for that, so 10 credits. 
and they're quite short. Um, or at least we think they're quite short. I'm sure the, uh, the students or the apprentices might have a different opinion, but it is about re-emphasizing what they've learned so far and trying to build it into to your own companies. OK, so while it looks like a lot of modules there, there's no real lecture here. We just put it in as 1.5. There's no real lecture in two of those modules. In Reflective ePortfolio, we have a writing center here and we try and get the students to meet them as well as part of that module. So there's the odd couple of hours that they do, but nothing like uh, the more traditional, uh, let's say, academic modules like warehouse and distribution or customer care or introduction to finance. In stage two, when they successfully completed uh, stage one, they can progress then and the process repeats itself. And I've just put up basically um, the structure of stage two. While it won't affect your apprentices this year, they will be doing other modules next year. And you can see we're trying to progress it each year in terms of what they're looking at. They're getting a diverse view from um, looking at HGVs in the first year, right up to road freight operations and route planning, and even we have a sustainable module in semester two. So it's a very diverse degree, I would say, in terms of looking at um, the different modules that we present. But then in terms of an apprenticeship, they're doing it while at work. Uh, they hopefully will see a connection between what your companies do and what they're learning in class. And then they're also uh, learning how to uh, drive and get their licenses all through the two years. And I've just included these. I won't overwhelm you with all of this information, but you can see there's a lot of variety in what we do. And again, in the second semester of the second year, for those mentors that are here, there's another reflective e-portfolio, which is very critical to the learning again, and is run in exactly the same way as the first, first year module I discussed earlier. Again, our case studies will be adapted to uh, what modules they're covering, plus also how it's relevant to uh, the individual companies. So I did want to talk a little bit more about the reflective e-portfolio modules themselves. The idea there, according to the first bullet point that we have, is we're looking to link what they're learning in class or their academic learning with what they're learning at work, OK, and their work experience has given them. And just trying to demonstrate that there is a link between the two and getting them to apply it and actually build on that learning that they're getting in the two places. Remember, it's an apprenticeship and that's what's important, that these recognized uh, modules that are aimed at uh, the workplace then are building what we're learning in the college and vice versa. Uh, we look at obviously trying to link uh, to key aspects of transport operations and it involves completion of certain tasks and we're calling them tasks. We were calling them case studies, but that might sound a bit too formal for us. Rather, they're tasks that we ask them to look at and try and bring together learning from their different modules with what they're seeing at work. And that's really what it has done uh, in terms of a realistic application of their knowledge, or we at least intended to be a realistic application of their knowledge. And we do take feedback from mentors in terms of the kind of tasks that we ask them to do. Uh, again, it's all about work based learning. And so this is why the mentor's role is absolutely critical in the completionist module. So not only understanding that they have other modules to complete, but also uh, understanding that they, they'll need to speak to someone with more experience and maybe help them formulate their thoughts a little bit um, in terms of what the company does and then relate that to the learning that they're, they're going through or the learning experience. Um, so you have an apprentice and then you have a mentor or you might have a manager or a mentor and a manager, maybe the same person. Um, it, it doesn't really matter as long as everyone is aware of their roles. And we do talk to the apprentices about their role. They're responsible for their learning. Um, and we do talk to the mentors in terms of trying to provide guidance. We have documentation to go through and presentations. I'm not going to overwhelm you with that uh, today because it's a lot of information, but it's just to emphasize while the apprentice is responsible for their own learning, the mentor does play a key role you know, in facilitating and helping them improve uh, their, their learning experience. Um, obviously, as an apprentice, and this is what we tell our apprentices, they have to fulfill the roles, uh, sorry, the obligations of their role at work. Uh, so four days a week they are working for you and, and they must obviously do that in a, a comprehensive fashion. And then they must be dedicated to their lectures for the day that they're with us, uh, their online lectures. That is challenging. 
a series of four or five lectures during a day is challenging to stay focused the whole time. But we really emphasize the importance of that because it will save them time in the long run uh, if they are engaging in classwork and not missing uh, classes. We also ask them, as we said, with the uh, previous modules to complete work based tasks. Um, and look at you know whether it's a re reflective e-portfolio or we have on the other modules or lectures often try and say well we're going to do in a project maybe on customer care but try and relate it to your company not just some random company okay and that's one example of one that we did this year so it's always trying to apply it back to where uh, they're working in the workplace that they're they're actually in so that they can apply the, their learning as they, they move through the degree and it is important to know for ourselves uh, that as apprentices, they have a full time job. They're learning one day a week, but they'll also have to set aside time for themselves to complete the projects. And if they're not engaging in classes, um, and this is what I was trying to advise, advise, advise them, excuse me, that you save yourself time by going to, to lectures, fully engaged, asking questions and working through. Whereas if that doesn't happen, then um, you're going to have a lot more time outside of the program to, to work on that. But generally, there will be uh, a certain amount of time that they're going to have to commit to finishing off projects or doing assessments each week as they work through the semester. Now, we like to give them deadlines and uh, at the start of the semester for when projects are due, uh, and we will certainly bring that up in induction. We may not have the exact dates there, but we'll give you an idea of what's uh, going to happen and they'll certainly have it for the start of lectures uh, in the subsequent week. In terms of uh, the roles and responsibilities of the mentor or manager, we're looking obviously they attend work uh, and the online session. So it'd be great if someone at work will touch base with them uh, every week saying how are lectures going? Um, have you any issues? And myself, Megan and Aidan are always contacts and Rachel who's on the call as well for people that might have queries. This is a new experience for a lot of people, so I'm sure there are going to be a lot of queries and we do hold these type of sessions from time to time, or you can just drop an email saying I have a concern or I'm just wondering about something. So don't, don't uh, feel that you can contact us either. Drop us a line or give us a call. And we, we, I'm sure we'll be able to answer your queries. One of the important tasks as part of the reflective e-portfolio is actually the mentor has to sign off before the uh, task uh, that they're looking at is actually submitted. It's actually the mentor that's saying, yeah, we're happy that he's completed this uh, successfully, or uh, I think she should go away and do uh, a bit more work. So we give them three attempts at it to go back to you. And then on the third attempt, if you're happy, they can submit it. Really for us, uh, I won't say you're grading it, but you're saying it meets a certain level. And then we obviously trust that you review that. We'll quickly review it and say that it's done, and then it moves on again to the ne next task. But what is important then, as you can see, is that you're having regular meetings uh, and face to face meetings, if at all possible. Sometimes it's not with the apprentices to check how they're getting on and check that they're on top of their workload and check that they're working on their tasks. OK, again, uh, if there are any queries or you feel there are any issues, you can certainly feel free to contact us, contact us here in Sligo or uh, Megan or Aidan at FTAI. So what, what do we need to do in the final slide? Everyone will be uh, relieved to know uh, we have induction day coming up this day week. Uh, that's nearly a full day on campus. Uh, to give you a brief outline, we're asking people to come along between uh, to arrive on campus, let's say between 10, half 10, around that time we'll have tea and coffee. We'll go into a session to introduce everyone. Solace will take the apprentices for a short session just to uh, introduce the whole idea of an apprenticeship and what's actually expected of them. Uh, which is very important for them to know that Solace is there as well. And while that's going on, then we might have a separate mentor section or a company session uh, where I'll talk through maybe the more uh, challenging aspects and the, the items we've noticed over the last year for our mentors and for our companies. Then we'll come back together and we go through a full breakdown of the, the, the actual programme and what's going to happen over the next semester and next two semesters. And then um, after lunch, we're going to try and bring um, all of the our apprentices into one room with a computer laboratory where we'll introduce them to the online environment. Um, and we should have everyone registered that stage that's registered. And if we don't, we have some uh, usernames that they can borrow, let's say, for the day, but it won't be their own. So if you can get them registered 
for the session, that would be great. Uh, but if if you don't, it's not a complete disaster, but um, it's very important to uh, get them along on that day so that they can work with us on the different aspects of uh, using our systems. We take them through or we give them an example of what a live lecture looks like or a live session. Uh, we show them where they can access the recordings, all of those aspects, but that would be an important aspect for every Tuesday of every week for the following 13 weeks then. On campus days, as I said before, we're going to try and have a couple of those because we find not only is there a good environment for learning, but also uh, it does maybe increase uh, their engagement in the programme and it allows them to meet their colleagues uh, from the uh, different co companies around Ireland who are doing the apprenticeship as well. We'll also have mentor training sessions. So on that induction day will be the first one. So while the apprentices are in the computer lab with some of my colleagues, um, I hope we'll be able to have a, a short session with the mentors and the company representative to explain what actually uh, it's going to involve. And I'll go into a lot more detail uh, in terms of what a mentor does, maybe from a day to day basis. And I'll give you some of the documentation for you to review and then we can have another session towards the end of the semester, the middle of the semester, and then you'll be we'll have one again in semester two when uh, the, the mentor module, let's say, starts. But the whole idea of the mentor training that we'll do next week is more about being aware of what uh, the apprentices are going to have to face uh, in terms of challenges of studying and doing assignments over the coming semester. We also have quite a few supports in ATU Sligo and I've just put the links there as you can see and I'm just going to briefly flick through them. I'm not expecting you to take them on board now, but we will certainly look at them again. Um, sorry, the student timetable there. The student, if anyone is looking at it, there's a student portal. Uh, so you may have apprentices already registered. They can certainly go on here and have a look at how ATU Sligo works and they have their own special section. Anyone can access this and it gives general links to different aspects so they might want to read stuff. I'm not going to go through all of this now. We do an induction, but things like admissions office and exams offices will be very important to the life of um, uh, the apprentice moving forward. Faculty of Business and Social Sciences is where our programme sits. And then obviously maybe a lot of this stuff will be more relevant to people that are going to be living on campus as opposed to those uh, that may be online. But I welcome the students to go down through it um, uh, and always encourage any student in ATU, uh, new student coming to ATU to look th through that before they arrive on site in case they have any questions. One of the examples we have are our Academic Writing Centre. As you'll see the link to and you can see that we know when people are coming back to education or moving into third level that they uh, may need some help in terms of the way we write things in academia can be a little bit uh, different to what we might write every day. So uh, particularly the way they present assignments and the rules associated with that. So there's a, a whole academic writing centre that a student can contact at any time, but we also organize some separate tutorials for them at various stages and hopefully we'll have the academic writing center along to visit them next monday as well after lunch okay so again that's something that could be looked at there are other academic supports i won't go through all of them now here but there you see the center there's right online writing courses all of these we've encouraged our students to look at in time when they're maybe struggling with a certain issue if they want to look at some recordings or some supports there and then more importantly the student support services uh, which our apprentices can obviously avail of, but we do know that some students maybe uh, might have dyslexia. And this is where, for example, if I look here, if they have some issue like that, then we would encourage them and encourage yourselves to just mention it to them. They may never feel comfortable talking about it. They, some students don't even want to go and register for this, but it does make a big difference in terms of um, if they have dyslexia, at least we know about it. We can take that into account in their assessments or any exams that they do for us. But if they never tell us, we can't know. And we know some students have struggled on with this uh, issue like dyslexia uh, and never told anyone. And it really makes the learning experience very challenging for them. Whereas at least if they do register and you know get assessed, then it, it can make it a bit easier for them and we can take that into account when they're progressing through uh, their qualification or apprenticeship. OK, so it is important if you're aware of it or just mention to them that don't forget to consult all of the, the potential uh, supports that are there in ATU Sligo, because all of these people are very well qualified to look after our students and uh, it is an underutilized resource. Um, so 
I would encourage you to be aware of those as well. And that brings me to the end. I'm obviously here to the end of the presentation, um, so I'll answer any questions that you may have at that time. Okay. Aidan, will I hand over to yourself? Great. Thanks a million, uh, Tomas. I'll just see if I can uh, take control of this presentation. I don't, can you move it on, Megan, for me? Oh, yeah, OK. I'll move it on for you. Oh, you move it on for me. OK, super. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm delighted uh, to meet you online and uh, delighted that you are starting this journey of the Transport Operations Commercial Driving Apprenticeship. So this is our second intake. So we started last year. So we've gone through a huge learning curve over the last 12 months. Um, and part of that is uh, delivering uh, an update uh, based on, on our experiences to date rather than going into the unknown like we did last year. But I suppose that there's a bit of light and shade in all of this. Uh, we've gone through the academic piece and then the on-road driver training pieces, uh, one of the areas I'm sure that you as an employer, but also the apprentices are, are very keen to understand um, and, and get a bit of information on. And, and this happens uh, in a structured way as agreed with the consortium uh, steering group um, and we will keep you updated on, on changes or information in relation to this particular piece um, as you go through your journey with us. Uh, but actually applying for a driving test um, and lessons and all of that type of stuff is, is quite a thorough um, uh, piece and there's 16 steps, believe it or not, in the application process for attaining uh, uh, your CE driving license, which ultimately is what everybody wants to get, I, I would imagine, uh, by the end of the program. But uh, there's a couple of employer requirements at, at the start. Um, a medical for the apprentice, so it's a medical fitness to drive. So you actually need a valid medical, um, which which is uh, only valid for one month in advance of applying for um, a learner permit. So we're encouraging all employers and apprentices to try and attain the learner permit as soon as possible um, uh, as they start the academic year. And the reason for that, one, it's a driving apprenticeship, right? So if people unfortunately have an issue and they don't pass their medical, uh, they won't be able to get the driving license. Uh, and that's a real challenge from an employer perspective, uh, but also in terms of meeting the minimum requirement for the, for the program. And two, um, it also kind of keeps uh, employers and apprentices um, engaged at, at the outset in terms of help, helping the apprentice uh, attain the learner permit and that everybody's on the same page uh, from a class perspective uh, as we look to start the on-road driver training piece. So if you haven't done so already, uh, we'd encourage you to look up at uh, the requirements and we've a lot of documentation and guides we've um, uh, in relation to the on-road driver training element. If you haven't got it already, we'll be able to send you a link to that, which, which highlights uh, uh, the steps involved in, in looking at the medical, the application for the 100 multiple choice uh, questions that are needed to be taken uh, in advance of, it, of getting uh, the learner C uh, permit. Um, and then the on-road driver training uh, piece itself. Um, it's two hours one-to-one uh, -one training. Um, we're kind of making recommendations as a consortium, 16 to 20 hours of training. Um, and the training will start 10 weeks prior to uh, the driving test date. So there will be two sessions like this, one to attain the rigid license at the C license and the other to attain uh, the CE, the Arctic uh, driving uh, test license. Next slide there. Great. Um, so as you see there on, on the right hand side, we have uh, just published a frequently asked question on, on the road driver training piece, which which answers a lot of questions um, and highlights a good bit of information that we've learned ourselves over the last 12 months. But we found uh, in last year that the average number of hours uh, delivered for apprentices as they're learning um, uh, as they're preparing for their C license test was around 19 hours, right? So the consortium have agreed uh, to pay a maximum of 24 hours of training, but ultimately the recommendation from, from our subgroup and the consortium was that 16 hours of training should be enough for an apprentice as they um, uh, prepare for the driving test. But everybody's different. 
Um, and I suppose the, the key message for us is, is that the engagement with Megan and myself uh, in relation to how apprentices are getting on, how they're getting on with their, their, their driving instructor and so on is really important. And from an employer mentor perspective, it's really important uh, that there is engagement with you and the apprentice as they are uh, preparing for the driving lessons, but also an acknowledgement uh, that we can't, uh, it's not an endless pit of funding uh, helping people, you know, with, with the number of hours uh, to get the, the driving test. So it needs a bit of focus. Um, so we have said we would pay a maximum of 24 hours, but we may have to change that because, as I said, it's it's state funded, uh, but we are looking at it year on year. Um, but effectively, from a consortium perspective, what you need to know in, in relation to the driving tests, um, the, the lessons are, are booked with designated training providers. So the consortium have an agreed sense of principles um, and arrangements in place with private driver, driver training schools around the country. Um, and your apprentice will be signed with a particular instructor in the region that they live and work. Um, so there may be a little bit of traveling time uh, for the apprentice, but we are trying to coordinate and work it uh, so that they are uh, not that inconvenient and it works for everybody. Um, at the moment, we have four training providers around the country um, and we will be deciding if these are the same training providers, uh, hopefully. Uh, for this this cohort, this intake, uh, but that will be determined uh, in ter uh, based on locations. Uh, but the training schools have um, an agreed uh, kind of memorandum of understanding with the consortium because the consortium pays for the driving lessons. Um, we have a requirement that there's updates on the training that's delivered, that there's evidence of the training that's delivered, um, and we get that on a weekly, monthly basis as uh, as the training happens. But I think it's really important uh, that you as an employer understand uh, how that uh, happens um, and that training uh, documentation will be available to you as well if, if you request it. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the apprenticeship co coordinator will liaise with apprentices to ensure the lessons are progressing. Now, these are generally organized and can be organized uh, before work, but not on the same day as, uh, well, not during uh, the academic lectures. So they take place at different times to the lectures. They can happen early in the mornings, they can happen in the evenings, and they can happen at the weekends as well. So I think it's it's uh, in the apprentice's interest uh, when they do get the contact details for their driving instructor uh, to be making uh, plans around their own training program uh, to suit their their uh, requirements, but also in consultation with you as the employer. So there's not that much more uh, disruption. And we, we've considered all of this as part of the consortium as well. But I said the on-road driver training um, frequently asked question document uh, highlights a lot of the learnings that we have uh, had over the last 12 months and provides very good information and feedback uh, that you can actually learn from this year as well. So if we go to the next one there, Megan, please, or to Moss. Right, so basically we're starting in a couple of weeks. The academic journey starts in a couple of weeks. Um, and the great thing about getting the, the apprentices ready for the on-road training and the driving test is that the driver module in semester one really helps the apprentices understand um, and prepare for, for the um, multiple choice questions and the driving test itself. Um, it, it also goes through the My Road Safety Portal, so it, and it goes through every single step that's required by the apprentice as they uh, get to start logging their on-road driver training um, in advance of the test. But typically, we'd be looking to start uh, the driver training at least 10 weeks in advance of a set test date. OK, and again, this is designed not to add pressure on businesses. So we decided not to start the on-road training and test pre-Christmas because it's a busy time for everybody, um, but also to perhaps start after the first semester um, at the end of January as we start the second semester to do the test in March or April. So they should have a full C license by uh, March, April uh, 2024. Uh, we then take a break um, and the consortium have decided in our wisdom uh, that we want the apprentices back for the second year of the apprenticeship program. Um, and the Arctic test will be scheduled for around October. So the lessons uh, for our first uh, year students who are now starting second year 
have commenced in the last couple of weeks in advance of an October uh, driving test date. Um, and I think that's worked well. And we've we've done that in consultation with both the apprentices and the employers. Now, I know some are very keen to keep going, but I think the other thing from an employer's perspective to recognise, and, and we have highlighted this um, within the document, and I think this is really important as, as we're talking about uh, driving on National Slowdown Day, but it's a real road safety initiative piece um, that employers understand you have to decide when you want your apprentices to be out driving for your company. And we make recommendations in the uh, in some of the guides that, you know, I wouldn't be recommending just giving them the keys of a truck the minute they pass and get their full C license, that there is, um, you know, support, there is a, a, a dedicated plan from you as an employer uh, to be carrying out perhaps additional defensive driver training, eco driver training, um, and definitely driver assessments um, uh, separate to these individual uh, driving lessons so that you as an employer can determine when you believe your apprentice is, is fit to drive safely uh, on our roads, um, uh, carrying out their duties as you see fit. So that that's a bit of a journey that you guys need to be developing a plan for and thinking about that uh, as the apprentices uh, get and pass their C licenses. Of course, uh, going back to the eagerness of people to get the Arctic license, uh, we do take a break, as I mentioned, so so maybe from March, April, uh, the lessons won't be scheduled again to August. So where where apprentices can, can keep um, their skills or hone their skills in terms of uh, on-road driver training in a rigid vehicle, we very much encourage that, but under supervised uh, conditions. Um, and as I said, don't don't be making a decision for them to go out on their own um, until uh, you have carried out your own due diligence and so on and, and safety checks. Um, but we ha we have to be cognizant that this isn't um, you know a, a, a kind of a, a sprint. It's it's more like a marathon in terms of delivering very safe uh, drivers on our roads and um, in line with uh, the academic requirements of the program as well. So um, uh, and I think it's working well. But of course it, we are early days. Uh, but everything seems to be going well at the moment. As I said, the CE licenses have uh, uh, lessons have started in the last couple of weeks. The other thing, if your apprentice already has a C license and just wants to get a C license, um, that that uh, that training will still coincide with when the main group are going to be doing their CE lessons, uh, their Arctic lessons. So they will, um, you know, obviously be able to attend the program, go through the program, but their lessons for the Arctic won't start until the rest of the class is doing it. The other thing is the employers can decide whether or not they want their apprentices to get the Arctic license. So if, you've, if you're an organization that just has rigid trucks, there's nothing to say uh, that in, in consultation with your apprentice or whatever, that, that they don't want to do the Arctic uh, uh, license, um, or they may come back to you and say they're not comfortable in doing the Arctic license, that is fine too, but as a minimum, they have to have a full C license as part of this particular program. Um, we are available. Um, and, and again, for whether you're an employer or a mentor, um, it is really important in terms of keeping in touch with us, asking questions, um, and to reiterate, I suppose, what Moss has said there, uh, the supports from both the college and ourselves are there, utilize them. The role of the mentor is massively important um, in relation to helping support the apprentices as they go through this journey, because there, there is quite a bit of work in it. It is a, an academic, it is a level six qualification. So there is a good bit of learning in the early months of this program, uh, but we are starting a lot earlier this year than we did last year. Um, and that was a real challenge for a lot of the apprentices from a timing perspective. Um, but both supporting the mentor and the apprentices uh, uh, through their journey is will, will pay back to you as an employer. And we very much encourage that. So look, I think that, that's all I wanted to, to really uh, highlight um, as part of my engagement with you guys today. Just again to say we're delighted to see you um, and we really hope your journey on this particular apprenticeship programme is a positive one um, and uh, best wishes to everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Aidan, and thanks, Tomas. Uh, if you want to just click forward there, Tomas, you can click one again. 
So I just want to take the opportunity again to just welcome everybody in. So all our new employers who are on board, some of who are here, some who can't join us. But it's great to see so many new faces and new companies signing up. So we're excited to meet you all. You've all kind of met me maybe in some way, shape or form and you've had information overload. So don't worry, I'm not going to go through anything else really. I just want to highlight the social media channels we have. So Tomas, if you could just share. Oh, there's a few more logos there. So our social media channels there. So we have our LinkedIn page, our website, our Instagram and our Twitter. So some of you might have seen already, we've been using these channels to help share your vacancies, to help with recruitment, but also as well, we want to use these channels as a way to share the good news stories and the progression of your apprentices. So if there ever is anything that you're sharing on your company social media channels in relation to the programme or the apprentices, please do tag us share with us and uh, let us know if there's any publications any news pieces any media pieces we'd be only too delighted to share them and you've probably seen before like sometimes say last year when our apprentices were passing their driving test of course we won't post anything without everyone's permission but we were happy to share some of those um photos and some of those good news stories as people were passing their tests just to really show the good work that the apprentices are putting in they're working so hard for it you guys as employers are doing a lot to support them so it's great to be able to use that to show and advertise what's going on so the channels are there if you click on one Tomas it'll show you the exact um handles for each one so the website if you haven't seen it already is www.cdap.ie so the commercial driving apprenticeship so there we advertise the job roles there'll be lots of like employer guides uh, the frequently asked questions. You can see some video um, testimonials from previous apprentices and employers there as well, if you want to take a look. And then our Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn handles are there as well. So do take the opportunity to follow them, to interact with them, see what's going on in the program. We'll use it as well to share if we're attending any events. Like we go to different careers fairs, school fairs, different conferences throughout the year to help promote the apprenticeship and the work that's being done. So it's just a good opportunity to be able to see all of what's going on and kind of a one stop shop to keep up to date. And as both Tomas and Aidan have said, please do feel free to reach out with any question, any query to myself, to the info at CDAP email address, directly to Tomas or Aidan, depending on the query. And there's no such thing as a silly question. We're always learning or always looking to take on board feedback as well. As Tomas has pointed out, like the mentor feedback is invaluable to us to understand how the program is working. It is only a new program, so we are always looking to make changes and looking to ensure that the program is delivering what the industry needs and that it's supporting the apprentices. So anything good, bad, indifferent, please do let us know if there's any queries. If anyone, I know I've been talking to a few people so far this morning, but if anyone has any issues with registrations or with SOLIS authorizing officers or even just getting your actual apprentices registered, please do reach out. We are here to support and ensure that that all gets across the line. So I'm going to leave it there. If you want to just click on, I think we can stop the recording there at the moment and then we can just open the floor. Then if anybody has any particular questions or queries they want to ask us now while we're here in the room, uh, we'd be happy to take them.